Welcome to the Mets Pod. On today's show, Taiwan Walker looking like his all-star version. Is it sustainable for the second half of the season? Taking a look at the lineup, is the Mets DH currently on the team for the pennant race? Reinforcements are on the way as Max Scherzer, James McCann, and Trevor May work their way back before the break. And we're going to take a look at the farm system as multiple prospects have been scorching in the month of June. As always, we close out the show with your mailbag questions. Reminder to subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcast, Spotify. You can watch and listen on SMY's YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Mets Pod. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined, as always, by my co-host, Joe DeMeo. The Mets taking three out of four against the Miami Marlins, coming off a really good stretch here as they were happy to be home. And man, the pitching is keeping things alive right now for the Mets as the offense continues to stay hot. So, Joe, let's waste no time. Let's bring you in. The Mets continue to be up on the weaker teams in their division as they finally ran into the Marlins. Well, first, big thanks uh, to everyone at SNY for getting everything set up last week for the live show. And thanks to everyone who, you know, a few people came up, said hi to us, got a couple fist bumps in the stadium saying people love the love the show and my perfect kind of interaction. Love the show, fist bump and keep walking. But, <laughs> Short uh, and uh, sweet. <laughs> but appreciate appreciate everything with that. But like you said, great weekend series uh, against the Marlins, taking three out of four. Losing the game to Sandy Alcantara is something I think you just kind of got to accept that at this point, he's arguably the best pitcher in the National League. And he showed every bit of that in his start against the Mets this weekend. So they go, take care of business, like you said, against one of the lesser teams in the division. And we talked about it on the show last week. That's what Atlanta was doing. Maybe it wasn't specifically Miami, but they were beating up on the lesser teams. The Mets are now going to have a little bit more of that in their schedule and they're going to have the opportunity to kind of do what Atlanta did. Absolutely. Everybody's taking advantage of their chances to play the Nationals, who are just barely fielding a major league team right now. So if you're the Mets, you've already had a lot of those opportunities. It's good to see them take care of business against a Marlins team that, even in their lowest of low years, are kind of a thorn in the Mets' side. And a big part of this right now is uh, the recent success of Taiwan Walker Listen, when Max Scherzer goes down, Tyler McGill, unfortunately injured again, he's going to be out for maybe the better part of a month or two here uh, on the more brighter side of things. Jacob DeGrom's still working his way back from injury. You look at Chris Bassett to frontline this rotation. He looks like a, his himself again back at home. Carlos Carrasco uh, kind of making putting the last year in the rearview mirror and looking like the old version of Cookie. Taiwan, kind of the forgotten guy right now. And Joe, a sub-3 ERA. He's 5-2 and two right now. The last three games, he's pitched at least six innings. Working deep into games is so important right now as uh, for those three pitchers specifically to keep the bullpen a little bit fresh. Joe, I look at this in two ways. One, we've seen this with Taiwan Walker before. He was an all-star last year. So we know this version of Taiwan Walker uh, is very real. It's not just a few really good starts. He has done this for a full first half of the season. I think the biggest question I have right now is, is it sustainable, right? The Mets don't need him to pitch like a number one or a number two, especially when Scherzer and DeGrom do return. But Joe, can he pitch like a middle of the pack, middle of rotation starter in the second half of the year? Uh, now that he does have a season behind him where he w had a full workload, where last year that just wasn't the case. Taiwan Walker's always been a guy that performed when he pitched. And as we as you just mentioned like last year was basically his first full workload season pretty much in his in career yeah, yeah yeah he basically has not done that to me do i think everything he's doing is sustainable i don't think he's going to be uh striking out 10 batters per nine innings consistently i don't think that that's really where he's going but what what's impressed me and i think has brought him you know closer to that all-star form is the fastball velocity is there in the start against Miami this weekend, you saw him touching 96 miles an hour, which is really where you want him to be. And his splitter has been unreal. That thing's completely falling off the table. And that's really what's getting most of his swings and misses at this time. And he's commanding the ball. I think those things is what's sustainable. I think the velocity's there. I think the splitter's there. The control is there. He may not miss 
bats at the rate that he's doing, but I don't see any reason why Taiwan Walker can't pitch like a, I mean, if you call it a number four starter, that would be more than sufficient for what the Mets need, you know, certainly as we go over the next couple months. So as I said earlier at the top of the show, uh, Chris Bassett, obviously happy to be home after a pretty tough road stretch there. Uh, he's just been a different pitcher uh, on the road this year compared to home for the most part. And most recently, you and I were obviously at the game where we did the live show. He goes eight scoreless innings against the Brewers and then against Miami over six innings pitch, three earned runs, but really did a good job. Nine strikeouts, looked in control for much of that game. So now I look at this, Joe, Bassett has been rock solid for the Mets this year. Taiwan Walker, an excellent first half once again. Cookie Carrasco back to himself. Help is on the way. Scherzer, obviously, is going to return even sooner than people expected. DeGrom, you know, will remain hopeful that he can be a long-term impact piece of the second half of the season. But when you look at it, do you think the Mets still need to add starter depth at the deadline? Where they've gotten through a lot of the stretch right now. McGill's been healthy, injured, healthy, injured. You know, Peterson has had to make starts here and survived. He gets out of a lot of trouble. But do you think the Mets right now... Maybe remember when they got Rich Hill, a player like that, that is a guy that is a fit starter, maybe long relief kind of player. Do they need that kind of help, even with reinforcements on the way internally? That's exactly where I was going to go. I don't think they need a starting, like a starting pitcher that you say. Like Castillo. Yeah, they don't need to go get someone that you're locking into one of the five rotation spots and starting every fifth day. I think if they could get someone akin to a Rich Hill, like they did previously, where the vision is, this guy's going to pitch out of the bullpen, but if we need him to start, he's capable of doing so. Uh, I wish I had a good name for you as to who would really fit that. Rich Hill again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is Boston selling? If if they yeah. are, bring Rich Hill back home. But I think that that would make some sense because they do need some reinforcements in the bullpen a, as we get closer to the deadline. And obviously having more starting depth is never a bad thing when you have Jacob deGrom, you know, working his way back and, you know, when he does come back, he hadn't pitched in a year. And he certainly has shown a propensity over the last, you know, 12, 15 months that things might pop up. So when he comes back, there's a possibility that something else nags and he, and he could potentially miss some time. Scherzer's on the older side. You'd like to think he's coming back from his oblique. He'll be good the rest of the way. But we always say it here. You never have enough pitching. So if you could get someone... That could kind of be a hybrid bullpen slash starter. I think that would fit pretty well. All right. Now looking at the offense here, I've, we've talked about the pitching a lot over the weeks, and they're, they're treading water. The starters are getting it done. The Mets don't need to be, you know, winning every nine of ten games, but can they keep themselves well above 500? they They've done exactly that, and these starters have gotten it done uh, with help on the way. Looking at the offense, obviously we text all the time before we do the show and one thing that is constantly on my mind most recently is despite the Mets success despite their offensive success making contact driving in runs being aggressive on the base, base paths the Mets are not getting anything from the DH spot overall and it really doesn't matter who's out there I think JD Davis has been better recently but I think JD is clearly a very matchup based player at this point Nick Plummer, hot start, fun story, then just complete skid, right? It goes into downfall, spirals. We're going to see if Dom Smith has figured it out while down in Syracuse and coming back up. I think that's uh, unfortunately a bit of a long shot. Maybe Dom is a good bench piece, but the DH every day. I'm looking at the Mets pennant race already, right? This is a good team. They are over 20 games, over 500. They should be playing October baseball. Right now, Joe, to me, the everyday DH is not on this team. And I'm not thinking about who that DH is going to be when the temperatures get a lot colder in October. I'm thinking about for the stretch run where you need to put pedal to the metal, you need to put your foot on the gas, and you need to stay well ahead of the Braves, and you need to win the division. You need to lock down the division. I love what this offense has done. But the fact that they've done this without getting that pop from a designated hitter, to me, is really impressive, but not something they should just take for granted and run with it and say, we're fine here. I think it's quite evident that the DH that you're looking for is not currently on the roster. Like you said, JD Davis has played better, but he like everyone else seemingly getting hit in the hand by pitches because oh. for, for some reason the Mets get hit. Not only do they get hit by pitches, 
but it's always forearm, wrist, hand. Just hit someone in the numbers and let's yeah. just move on. It was the head but, to start the season. Yeah, and it was the head to start. Yeah, so not convenient spots, but hopefully it seems like he may have avoided a fracture, but he's getting extra testing to confirm. But he's been better of late. Dom Smith went down to AAA Syracuse and did kind of what I thought he would do. He performed pretty well, hit a couple home runs, so maybe some confidence he'll come back and be able to you know, help out in the interim. But I think as we approach the August 2nd trade deadline, which is, I mean, seems like it's far away, but it's really not. It, we're just over, just over a month, really. And at that point, I think the designated hitter would be something I would definitely, definitely think the Mets should look into. And we mentioned it on the podcast last week that they're 18th in the league in home runs. So while they're putting the ball in play, they're getting on base, they're making contact, they're driving in runs. They're not really hitting for the power that you would like. So I would say it would be a good idea for them to investigate the market for a true power hitter that can fill that DH role on a, on, let's just call it a near everyday basis. Yeah, and it sounds like they're going to take a look at a guy like Daniel Palka, who has, you know, shown power in the majors before but has also there's a reason he's been in Syracuse the entire year I think that's more of a player that maybe you hope can get you to the trade deadline right you're trying to always get a spark they got that spark very briefly from Plummer it ran out they're hoping to get some matchup what's interesting to me with JD Joe is, is his splits right now he's been worse against lefties this year and he just he hasn't been overly overwhelmingly good against either side of the plate and it's pretty much the same amount uh, of plate appearances about he's got about 10 more against righties he's hit a home one home run against against each so the power for jd has not really been there he's not taking advantage of those lefty matchups which we've seen him in the past be able to capitalize on those so as solid as he's been in recent weeks once again this goes back to you know i'm not one of those people that's saying the mets need to go trade the house for jd martinez to be their everyday dh that's not what i'm saying but i think they just need more pop from this spot in the order where you can get the occasional home run or a guy really just with power and on base ability. You don't need somebody that hits 300. You don't need somebody that drives in over a hundred runs each year, but this is an area that a lot of teams do not struggle with solving at deadlines uh, in a cost effective manner. Each, each trade deadline. Am I wrong there? Like you're not talking about like Brett Beatty, obviously Alvarez, maybe even Mauricio needing to be the piece to acquire a capable bat. No, I think, I mean, we're going to go back to the Braves again, looking at what they did last year. It's and the most obviously recent I, example. Yeah, it's the most recent example. And I mean, the odds of doing that same exact formula and having it work exactly the same, probably not that high. But you just look at, I mean, a guy like Jorge Soler, when they when the Braves traded for him, he was an inconsistent hitter, but he hit home runs. And the Mets need somebody like that. I mean, is a Trey Mancini from Baltimore available? He has a mutual option for next year which basically is a player option. So you would you would think that he's essentially a rental in Baltimore. He's someone that could be available. Maybe uh, maybe he'll cost you a little bit more for this guy, but I, I would at least place a call to Colorado and ask them what they want for CJ Crone, mm. who's been fantastic this Scorching year. Scorching this year. Yeah. You want power? CJ Crone brings you power. Man, that's that's a really good name that we have not talked about a lot. He uh, is very cost effective, which we know Colorado likes. I believe he is signed also through next year, and yeah. so he he won't hit free agency until 2024, where he'd probably be around 34, or 35 years old. So for Crone right now, uh, maybe they will want something significant back. He's hit 17 homers already. He's batting around 300, OPS over 900. I definitely think that's in the upper tier of names, yeah. Joe, but definitely somebody that if you get a team that's selling, like a Colorado, and they're looking at it and they go, man, maybe we could squeeze out a little more from a team right now because he is under cost control for 2023 rather than just getting that rental kind of trade. You never know. It's an interesting name. And as it stands right now, let's be real, the Mets don't have a DH plan for 2023 either. Obviously, Mark Vientos is going to get a look at some point for that kind of role. I know everybody's shouting from the mountaintops for Francisco Alvarez. He's the long-term catcher. He's not just coming up to hopefully hit a couple home runs at DH anytime soon. So uh, that's going to be something that you're going to hear us talk a lot about this on this show as we get closer to the deadline besides the bullpen help 
and besides maybe that sixth man in the rotation uh, like our old friend Rich Hill. All right, speaking of pitching, there are reinforcements on the way. Max Scherzer making a rehab start on Tuesday night in Double A Binghamton. Max uh, apparently going to be a one, hoping to be a one and done guy. He doesn't want to be pitching in the minors very often. He wants to make his one start and come back to the big leagues. Uh, Trevor May is working his way back. James McCann is working his way back, which I think quietly, I know fans are tough on him because of the lack of offense, but we've seen, you know, when a guy like Mazika is thrown into the fire, how long some of the communication hurdles have been between the veteran starters on the staff, notably Chris Bassett, um, and, and the catching. So James McCann's return will be welcomed with open arms. But Joe, what kind of difference, I guess we'll start at the top with Scherzer. When Scherzer's back in the rotation, especially with McGill going back down again, I think it puts the Mets back into win almost every night kind of mode versus let's just stay alive with where, where we're at right now. I mean, it's it's a kind of obvious, right? You're, you're getting back the $43 million a year arm that was the, the huge free agent signing and, you know, a true frontline pitcher, like you said, shifts everyone down a spot. Clubhouse Obviously, presence is amazing. Clubhouse presence. And, you know, we talked about it while we were watching the game last week, and it was kind of a joke on Twitter. Uh, that Chris Bassett struggled once Max Scherzer went away. Now Max Scherzer is, is back around the team, and Bassett has had two great starts in a row. So maybe it's not as much a, of a coincidence as we kind of joked about. But it's a, it's huge to be able to, to bring in to bring Max back. Like like I said, push everyone down a rung in the rotation, and then you know you you build towards the inevitable return of Jacob Degrom. And man, it, it's exciting because. When we were in spring training, we found out that Degrom was going to be out for an extended period of time. It was like, but I really want to see just Jake and Max go back to back. We're getting closer to July here, which if if things continue on the trajectory, like you said, if if Scherzer has a good outing tonight, it may be his only rehab outing. Uh, Degrom is seemingly getting closer and closer to some rehab action. We might be getting closer to actually actually putting that that theory together like what happens when the Mets are able to just throw DeGrom and Scherzer back to back in a series yeah we're excited to watch that um obviously hoping that that comes to fruition at some point because this Mets team as great as they've been especially right now top of the National League they can be a totally different animal with those guys I want to talk about Trevor May for a little bit kind of the forgotten man but I think unfortunately uh, the, the, the topic of anger felt like around the Mets fans, you know, these last couple of days has just been that Seth Lugo might not be the same guy right now. When you just look at face value, the ERA is still sub four. Um, the home runs on the pace are a little up strikeouts are down with Lugo. That's the thing that stands out to me about 8.6 strikeouts per nine. He's usually a guy that's in those double digits each year. Joe, what I find fascinating with Lugo right now and i'm gonna read this to you and i really want your reaction every time lugo has surrendered a run this year he's given up two runs at least two runs every single time he has not had an outing where he's given up just one run he's given up multiple runs i believe it is now in six appearances so the problem with lugo is that we're noticing is it's spiraling a little bit right it's not just hey i made my pitch and i gave up a solo home run you know, the game is tied or we have to fight our way back in. It's, I don't want to say meltdowns, but it's it's really bad appearances. When things are off with Lugo, it is spir spiraling right now. I want to take this back to Trevor May, but before we go there, is this something with Lugo uh, that you're noticing? Is his stuff not the same? Does he not look comfortable? Is it, honestly, it seems like location right now. You and I were texting during the, the Marlins game that he gave up the bomb that he took himself out of counts and just had to make a pitch and unfortunately was hit out of the park by a rookie. I mean, what is going on right now with Lugo, who we've seen be lights out in the past? The command isn't there, like you mentioned, and and the stuff is definitely not right, or at least not right on a consistent level. I mean, in the Marlin in the Marlins game that you just spoke about, I mean, his fastball was sitting ninety two to ninety three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Lugo is a guy that'll get up to ninety seven miles an hour, and you've seen that in good outings this year that he would get up there. So I, I don't know exactly what's going on but the stuff has been up and down and when the stuff is down it feels like he has you know real blow up type of outings like you said it's it's multiple runs it's multiple hits it's probably walking batters in most of the, in most of those as well so 
right now, I think Trevor May is who we're going to talk about in a second. I think he's looming larger than maybe we even thought he would, was when he went on the IL. I think so. And, it, you know, that's without even saying uh, what a savior Drew Smith has been for this team right now. Like, where would this team be right now in those seventh and eighth innings without a guy like Drew Smith having his breakout season? So that plays largely into it. We say over and over again every single week, there are going to be bullpen additions at the deadline for this team. That is a fact. And it might not even just be one arm. It might be two arms at that point. But when you look at May, a guy that, you know, everybody kind of rallies when he has his bad outings, but you love him when he has his good outings. He's a vocal guy on Twitter. He's obviously a, a really loved teammate. He's someone quietly last year, 3.59 ERA, pitched in 68 games. Uh, and the K per nine was around 12. So he can get you out of jams with the strikeout ability. The Mets miss him right now. The Mets really, really miss him. It's been the difference of having to, you know, not have that substitute for Lugo or not be able to balance Drew Smith with somebody else in high leverage eighth innings over and over again. Trevor May's return, if he can get back to the form that we've seen, and, you know, we always say how volatile relievers are. May is a guy that from 2018 to 2021 has nearly been the same guy every single year. High strikeout guy, always sub-4 ERA, pitches in a lot of ball games. I think it's safe to say the Mets have missed him in this first half. Definitely. They've definitely missed him. And I think his early struggles this year, I think his arm was bothering him prior to You could see it on happened. his face. Yeah, yeah. So I think he was going through it and just thinking it was maybe dead arm because of shortened spring training or just – you know, some soreness that these pitchers go through all the time. And obviously, it proved to be something bigger. I think when Trevor May comes back, to your point, I think you're getting a perfectly capable 7th slash 8th inning guy that's going to miss bats with a mid to upper 90s fastball that he shows the ability to elevate and get past bats and the above average slider. So I think he's going to come back and, and be Trevor May. That's fully what I expect. And like you said, there will likely be some bullpen additions here in the next five, six weeks, when, whenever the deadline specifically is from today. And the emergence of Drew Smith. And now maybe Seth Lugo could go to maybe a little bit of a lower leverage type of spot and maybe even become that two-inning guy. Yeah. And you throw, him, you throw him for two innings, you Fifth give him a couple sixth, days sixth off. Sixth seventh, yep. Yeah. And then give him a couple days off and then bring him back out. And one guy also that's coming back, not related to the bullpen, that kind of goes under under talk about, Travis Jankowski is getting mm, closer I and for, closer. I almost forgot about him yeah. in this list. So, so he said to the media, I believe last week, that he's targeting early July. So the Nick Plummer experiment, like you said, I think it's run its course for now. Doesn't mean Plummer doesn't have a future in the big leagues. I just think... It's about time he, he finds his way back to AAA Syracuse. And if you could get Jankowski back, bring that outfield defense, that speed, that on-base ability, and just a guy that really, I think he really fit in this clubhouse. Like, you remember when he said to the media that, you know, I know my job, no one's buying my jersey. And then Eduardo Escobar got the whole team Jankowski jerseys to wear during warm-ups. So... I think he's he, he was kind of missed from a clubhouse perspective and just an overall roster fit. But the Mets are getting closer to being healthy, and they've been able to manage the best record in the National League over 20 games over 500 while missing you know, re pretty significant pieces. Yeah, and like you said, Joe, he offers an element that this team hasn't really replicated, and that is the speed and defense guy off of the bench, whether it's you need that runner in extra innings, which is going to happen a lot in the second half of the year. You're going to be playing in a lot of close games, whether you need a guy to come in and play center field, take over a corner spot, rest Marte's legs, rest Canna's legs, rest guys like that, rest Nimmo. I mean, we need to be you need to be careful with load management with Nimmo because we've seen the injuries with him in the past. Jankowski absolutely uh, does have, you know, a significant role off the bench for this team. All right, the last one is McCann. Obviously, we could be pretty brief here with McCann, but I think there'll be uh, some smiles. And it's no slight again. Nito's fi been fine, obviously, right? And, you know, Mazika's done whatever he possibly can. But I think there'll be some smiles from a continuity standpoint from the starting pitching staff when they see James McCann back in that dugout. That's exactly what he's bringing to the table. He's a good leader behind the plate. He can call a game. 
the pitchers, even the veterans, are comfortable throwing to him. Teams and, have been running on the Mets lately, yeah, too. I've noticed they've been, that. And Nito has a good arm, but they've been yep. running on – they've even been running on Nito. I don't even know the last time Patrick Mazika played. Like <laughs> They're running like, Nito into the ground yeah, right yeah, now with Nito, McCann coming back. Nito's playing every single day, but uh, McCann's been with Double A Binghamton since this past weekend, and he's going to be catching Scherzer on Tuesday night for Double A. I imagine that his time is in the coming days, maybe by this coming weekend, would be my best guess. But I think the pitchers will very much appreciate having James McCann back behind the plate catching their pitches. I think so too. All right, a reminder, you are listening to the Mets Pod. Subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch and listen on SMY's YouTube or social media channels for our clip outs or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Joe, it's been a big month for the Mets farm system. It feels like even the guys that started out a little slow out of the gate have really, really figured it out. A hot June for many, many Mets prospects. I think we can talk about Francisco Alvarez on nearly every show at this point. But I saw you had a tweet. Uh, the month of June has been good to Mets top prospects in double-A. Alvarez has hit seven home runs in the month of June. Brett Beatty uh, with nearly a 900 OPS in the month of June. Ronnie Mauricio, an 854 OPS. So he's shown power. He's also stolen four bases. These are the three big names that we talk about all the time, and rightly so. Besides those guys, and you can even touch on them if you want to, Joe, what's standing out to you with the Mets minors this month? For me, I'm actually going to talk about Ronnie Mauricio for a second because, I mean, Francisco Alvarez, he's do it every monster. week. Could do it yeah, every week. Yeah, we could do it every week. He's a monster. It's just fun to watch. It's fun to watch those games on uh, online when I get to watch them. But what has stood out a little bit for Mauricio, and he still needs a lot of work on this, his plate discipline. He actually drew has drawn six walks, which seems like a low number, but six walks in the month of June – that would be the amount that he had in April and May combined. Okay. <laughs> so he still he still needs work on his pitch recognition skills. He needs work on, you know, drawing walks. And, but what he is doing really well this month is he's finding his pitch and being selective and crushing it when he does hit it. He has five home runs this month. Like we talk about Alvarez having seven. Mauricio's just a couple behind him. He's stealing bases. He's now in double-digit stolen bases on the season. And like I said, he, he's drawn a couple more walks. So to me, I think he's standing out in in a good way. You're seeing some some off overall offensive growth from him. He still has a, a ways to go on the plate discipline side. But I think Ryan Mauricio might be figuring figuring something out a little bit here at the AA level. Yeah, a player that just turned 21 years old. So I think there's room to obviously be patient with someone like Mauricio that even if you're one of those fans that goes, you know, I don't really know where his fit is. Francisco Lindor is going to be here for a really, really long time. They've obviously had, you know, pretty good options at second base. Jeff McNeil and Luis Guillorme included, you know, with, and Beatty kind of penciled in as hopefully the long-term third baseman. I think people look at Mauricio and go, is he the odd man out? Is he our big trade ship? Well, for that reason alone, you want to root for his development that at the worst case, he's a big time piece for this Mets farm system. Um, all right. And another guy that I did want to touch on, because I think, He's the big prospect name that's most closely associated with the call him up, call him up, call him up. Because Francisco Alvarez is in double A, so it still feels like we're a couple steps away from there. But Mark Vientos in triple A, and this is another one that you tweeted out. He only played nine games in June because he was on the IL. Um, but in the last 28 days, hitting 322, uh, OPS over 1,000, just crushing the ball. Six home runs, 16 RBIs. I know you said before, strikeouts and ground ball rate, still two things that concern you. But if you're looking for a guy in the system that hits the long ball and when he makes contact, hits it really, really hard, it's got to be Vientos. For sure. And the strikeout rate, it's high, but that often comes with a lot of power hitters, a pretty high strikeout rate. I'd like to see him get it below 30%. Um, right now he has a 31.9% strikeout rate. So if we could get that into the upper 20s, it's obviously not great, but it's kind of a, a more acceptable number. What I think is going to, what I think needs to improve, and I, I think it will as as the season progresses, because uh, he certainly struggled early on. His ground ball rate is at 52% right now, and a power hitter needs to be elevating the ball. And historically, he has in his career. So I think that is going to normalize as the rest of this summer goes on. But yeah, Vientos is just another one. Like 
Beatty, like Mauricio, like Alvarez that are on a real, real scorching uh, pace right now. And it's exciting when, when the top of the system is actually performing to their capabilities. And like you said, Vientos, he's on the 40-man roster. He's a call away. I assume... Does that surprise you that we haven't seen him yet with what the Mets have dealt with at DH? Not really, because I think they're probably looking at kind of those underlying things and saying, you take that 31% strikeout rate and bring it to the majors instead of AAA, is it more 37%? Mm. Yeah, you uh, don't want a guy to get in his yeah. head. and Right. And, young guy. And I think they also have visions of contending this year, and it's probably a better decision to not have Vientos come up for like a short, a short spurt and then send them back down because you traded for someone. So I think I'm not too surprised, and I do think he still has some things to work on, but I think he's probably he, he's maybe the second most exciting pure hitter in this system. Uh, Beatty has the defensive edge o- over him because Vientos is where he's going to play defensively is a bit of a mystery. The Mets have kind of scrapped the idea of him playing in the outfield. He's kind of more of a third baseman, first baseman DH now. His future home might be at DH, like I, I, you mentioned early on in the show. But he hits the ball as hard as anyone. That includes Francisco Alvarez. He does it to all fields, consistently barrels the ball up. He's got that short, compact, powerful stroke. So you think that that's going to translate at the next level. And he's not far away. It's just you wonder if it's if it will be this year or not. So those are the big names we always talk about. Alvarez, Beatty, Mauricio, Vientos. Um, obviously, when he was healthy, Matt Allen was in that group as well. As we get closer to the deadline, and the Mets are obviously hoping to move more middle-tier names, is there anybody Mets fans should be aware of that could be thrown in a package and they run to baseball reference and go, oh, my God, who did we just trade? Did we just trade a top prospect? Is there anybody you think they'd be more open to moving at this deadline if they try to stay away from the blue chip guys? I don't want to jinx it. I don't want. To, <laughs> I don't want to say You're a name. And say, yeah, I'm already nervous. I'm getting the sweats. Uh, I don't. I don't know who I don't want them to trade. I, I mean, I would think you would probably look into the lower minors. So more often than not, when you're making a trade at the deadline, it's a rebuilding type of team that's selling assets. They don't necessarily need a prospect that's in Double A AA or Triple A that's going to make an immediate impact. They might pursue uh, pursue someone with maybe a tick more upside that's more in the lower minors. A guy like, I don't want to wish that they trade him because I don't want them to, but a guy like Junior Santos, big right-handed pitcher who's pitching for high A Brooklyn. He's young. He can get it up to 96 miles an hour. Like, that's a guy that I think is intriguing. But, yeah, it's I, I'm going to I'm gonna keep the names of who's going to get traded maybe closer to the vest because I, I don't want any of them to go. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll highlight them if any of them do go uh, when trades start to go down. All right, of course, as always, we are closing out the show, answering your questions with the mailbag. And obviously, Joe, you got a lot of them this week. Let's dive into uh, our first one here as I scroll up on our text thread. Uh, with more, t- This one is from Noah Gattel, who always sends us really good stuff. He said, with more teams in the postseason, does it still make sense for a team to go all in at the deadline, uh, trading top prospects for a rental, as we saw with the Mets last year when they acquired Javi Baez? Obviously, that was the, he's kind of what he's pointing at here. Seems like the postseason is more of a crapshoot every year, and it's not worth mortgaging the future for a shot at the World Series. 100% agree. And it's funny, I was actually having a conversation with a friend about this yesterday, and I said basically exactly that, that. I don't think you need to go all in. And we go. I, I will continue to go back to Billy Epler's introductory press conference or one of his press conferences shortly after being hired. And he said, we are going to try to win every year, but we are not going to sacrifice winning a year down the road, two years down the road, three years down the road, just to win once. They want to be, they want to be a sustainable contender. And the way to be sustainable is hanging on to those top prospects, or at least as many of them as you can, be picky about when they're traded, and trade from kind of the depth of the system. And going into the draft, increasing the depth in the system will give you more ammunition to maybe trade a guy that's lower on your prospect list, but is more valuable than a higher prospect on another team's list. So I think the idea of going all in, 
I don't think you have to. And, you know, the Mets are a team that's right now the best team in the National League. And they still have their own personal reinforcements coming. Yes. So I so I think they need to – they just need to add at the edges. I think the bullpen, like we said, maybe a bullpen slash starter depth piece, a DH. If you want to upgrade Travis Jankowski, you can. But if they were to make a quantity of moves, I think that would make a pretty big impact on what they're doing for the rest of this season. And you'd be able to maintain some of those top prospects. I'm with you as well. I look over and over again, and, and my thoughts are just get two arms for the bullpen. Maybe get one of those in-between guys that's a sixth man in the rotation and a DH. And, and I know that might sound like a lot, but those are usually cost-effective additions. You're not looking at, let's trade for an all-star shortstop. Let's trade for an all-star center fielder. Let's trade for – we love Wilson Contreras on this show. Wilson Contreras should be a top-flight item on the trade deadline. He has been the best offensive catcher in baseball um, and a player that can make a significant impact. And, you know, that's probably going to cost you a lot, even if it's a rental. All right, this one from Robert Z, uh, who asked Joe, prediction if the Mets will go high school or college with their top five draft picks. So as we uh, get closer to the MLB draft, less than a month away, Joe, I know your first mock draft is dropping this week. This is a perfect time for this question. Yeah, uh, my first mock draft, you could check it out on sny.tv. It'll be dropping this week. And I don't know about like the split per se of if it'll be three college, two high school, three high school, two college or whatever. But I I, I would expect you'd see a mix. And in the mock draft, you will see, you know, I won't say what positions for each, but there will be a college player and a high school player selected at 11 and 14 in the mock draft. So make sure you check that out. But I, I think it will be a mix, and the Mets are in a position right now where they have the extra first-rounder for not signing Kumar Rocker. They have the compensatory pick for when Noah Syndergaard went to the Angels, which puts them with five of the first 90 picks in this draft class, which is obviously the opportunity to add some significant talent to a system that's very top-heavy and needs some depth. So that will be really big. And they ha also have the third biggest uh, draft bonus pool. So they're going to have the ability to be flexible with how they maneuver those dollars within the top 10 rounds. And yeah, so I think it'll be a mix. But if you look kind of historically at what the Mets do, they like high school bats in the first round. They like college arms in the first round. And, they, and they'll sprinkle in a college bat if someone kind of falls into their lap. But that I think that would be kind of the model to look at. And You'll see some high school stuff after round one. They have, I mean, consistently taken high school arms in the second and third round and paid them over slot bonuses. So I, that's kind of where I stand as of today. You know, we'll we'll get more information as we get closer to the draft, and I'm going to be doing multiple mock drafts. So this is mock draft 1.0, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll as we get closer, I think I'll have maybe some more insight as to kind of the real direction they're leaning. So let me throw in my own question uh, to cap off the mailbag here. That's on, uh, kind of a follow-up to that. When you are in a situation like the Mets, you have two top 20 picks. You obviously have five picks in the top 90, like you said, Joe. Is there a thought process maybe that you really try hard to go under slot on one of the first rounders, and that leaves the door wide open for one of those superstar guys that falls into the second or third round every single year because he might have – a commitment to play football somewhere. He might be somebody that teams are, no, he's not going to sign unless you blow him out of the water with overslot kind of money. Do you think that's a strategy? I remember we saw the Pirates do that last year and, and do it in a really effective manner. Uh, do you think that's a strategy that could be in play for the Mets this year with this? This is rare range of flexibility for the Mets in the draft. It definitely can. And uh, Tommy Tanis had said publicly, the Mets vice president of scouting, that they have to hit this draft because they may never get this pick situation again. It just might, might not happen. So they, they definitely need to hit here. But the idea of under slot, on average, most first round picks are under slot. I don't think they need to, and I, and I am not a big fan of the major haircut, which is, you know, you take someone that's maybe ranked in the 20s, at number 11, pay him way under slot. Not a fan of that strategy. I'd be looking to, you know, 
take the going talent. under. Yeah, take take the talent, obviously, but under slot at number eleven, especially as that pick will become unprotected since it's a, com- a compensatory pick. You you want to make sure you're drafting someone that you will sign at number eleven. So if you could draft a high school bat, college bat, someone like that, that might be a, a little bit under slot, give you some more money for number fourteen and and the rounds after. I think that would be, I think that would be a good use of their funds. All right. That is another episode of the Mets pod. The next time you hear us, we'll be recapping a uh, mini series with the Astros, two games in Houston, two games at home. The Mets see the Marlins again. We're going to see the Marlins a lot. You're going to hear a lot of Miami Marlins recaps on this show, but Joe closing thoughts as the Mets continue to stay well, forget well above 500. They are 20 plus games over 500 as everybody is listening to this show today. I mean, I've, I've kind of said it, many times for the closing thoughts just keep rolling keep win winning series keep winning. and it just keep winning series and you're you're going to be just fine and that's that's what the mets have not stopped doing all right reminder everyone to subscribe to the mets pod at apple podcast spotify you can watch or listen on smy's youtube or wherever you get your podcasts thanks so much everyone we'll catch you next week <laughs>